Carla Pufin put on the first slide, I thought I'd just uh, briefly go through some terminology and some very basic uh, anatomy and physiology so we all uh, kind of know what's, uh, what we're talking about as we discuss these. So what is pulmonary hypertension and how does it differ from pulmonary arterial hypertension? Well, first of all, pulmonary hypertension is a disease where the pressure inside the pulmonary arteries is higher than normal. Um, so it, it can occur in many different disease states. We're going to be talking about uh, those that occur generally in HHT tonight. Um, but there are, there are a number of different ways of pulmonary hypertension develops and in, uh, in which it uh, causes the, uh, the pressure inside the pulmonary arteries to be elevated. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a specific type of pulmonary hypertension. So I think just to take a step back for a moment, it's important to understand that um, all of what we're talking about is pulmonary hypertension tonight. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a very specific type of pulmonary hypertension. So all pulmonary arterial hypertension is pulmonary hypertension, but not the other way around. There are many different types of pulmonary hypertension, which is kind of the umbrella term for what we'll be talking about tonight. And can you go to the next slide? So uh, how does pulmonary hypertension occur? Why does it occur in HHT patients? There are basically two mechanisms. Now, that's not to say that if you have HHT, you can't develop pulmonary hypertension from many uh, other diseases that lead to it. Uh, but really, we're going to talk about tonight the two uh, types that occur in HHT patients that are unlikely to occur in other patients, with the exception of PAH, uh, which occurs in, in uh, other, other disease states as well. So the first type, and by far the most common, is that uh, pulmonary hypertension, which develops due to high output cardiac disease, which uh, is, some, is somewhat common in HHT patients. And I'll talk about that in a moment. The other form of pulmonary hypertension, which we call PAH, or pulmonary arterial hypertension, is a type that uh, happens because of a change in the pulmonary arteries and arterioles themselves, where they become stiff, where they become blocked, and the pressure moving through those blood vessels becomes limited and the resistance increases. So those are the two different types really we'll be talking about tonight. Okay. So just a quick, uh, very quick overview of the pulmonary circulation. This is a kind of a complicated looking uh, diagram, but I, what I want to call to your attention is that there, uh, the heart has two sides to it, the left side and the right side. Um, and that, uh, that is important to know. The left side pumps blood from the heart to the rest of the circulation, uh, it, it, to the rest of your body, and that blood is oxygenated. So it has had blood from the lungs come into the left side of the heart, and then it's pumped out to the rest of the body where it delivers oxygen. Once it's gone, gone through the tissues, through the arteries, uh, through the capillaries, back through the veins, it then comes back through uh, to the right side of the heart, uh, which, you can, which you can see in uh, blue there. And then it pumped, the right side of the heart pumps the blood to uh, the lungs where it gets oxygenated and sent back to the left side of the heart. Uh, just a quick note about, uh, about the pressures. I think we're all familiar with blood pressure when we go to see the doctor uh, and, and generally what that number is for most people. And that number is generally uh, fairly high with respect to the left side of the heart. So that resistance is, is pretty high. The left side of the heart is a strong muscle. It's built to push against that resistance. Of course, if the blood pressure becomes too high, that becomes problematic and uh, you know, doctors will recommend treatment. On the other side, the right side of the heart uh, is not as strong and it needs to pump blood to the lungs, but the resistance there is much, much lower. Just to give you an idea, if we talk about uh, a, a systolic blood pressure when the heart is pumping on the left side, it may be about 120 or so. Uh, in the right side, when it's pumping, the average pressure, we generally think of being under 20. So there's a significant difference there. And because of that, the right side of the heart is not really designed to pump against a, a very strong, a very high pressure. Okay. 
So in HHT patients, we talked about that most common form of uh, pulmonary hypertension. We have to talk quickly about the liver circulation. Okay. So again, here's a diagram and you can see two pictures of a heart just to kind of give you an idea. On the left side, the heart is pumping the blood out to the rest of the circulation that, uh, that's going through the aorta and then through the internal organs. And then you can see eventually uh, it makes its way back to the liver through one of two ways, either through the hepatic artery or the portal vein. And then the blood moves from uh, the liver to the hepatic vein and eventually goes back to the heart through, through the vena cava, a very large vein inside the body. Um, and what happens here is as the blood is being pumped through the liver, uh, that pressure drops significantly. So the blood, uh, the blood pressure coming out of the liver is significantly lower in the hepatic vein and we have uh, a normal circulation of blood through the heart and the liver. In HHT, as we know, uh, a significant percentage of patients uh, in some studies, up to 70% have liver AVMs and the liver AVMs bypass some of that circuitry uh, in the liver. Uh, can I have the next slide? Okay, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one. And okay, very crude diagram that I made for tonight, but you can see that black line basically is showing uh, an AVM, which basically is a blood, a blood vessel development where blood bypasses the liver into the hepatic vein and then goes back to the heart. The problem now is you don't have that slowing down of the blood uh, through the liver. So now the pressure is up much higher you're getting a lot more blood flowing back into the heart and the heart has to work harder. And this is what happens in a small uh, but significant uh, percentage of patients uh, with HHT. It tends to be more common in those patients with the ALK1 uh, uh, defect um, where liver AVMs are more common. So the blood, so the pressure in the heart rises up, that pressure is transmitted back from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart and the pressure in the lungs increases. So that's the most common type of uh, pulmonary hypertension that occurs in HHT patients. Okay. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, again, if we look uh, at the pulmonary circulation, remember the, the right side of the heart is pumping blood to the lungs, it gets the uh, oxygenated blood and goes back over to the left side of the heart. In, in pulmonary arterial uh, uh, hypertension, what's happening is those blue, the blue um, arterioles that you see there, the blue, artery, uh, blue arteries are bringing blood back in, but then from the right side of the heart, it, uh, the, the blood vessels are becoming very stiff and tight and the pressure is building up and pushing back on the right side of the heart. And remember the right side of the heart is not as strong as the left side of the heart. It's not capable of pushing against the, the resistance that the left side can. And so over time, what happens is the right side of the heart begins to fail and it begins to become larger and it becomes uh, less able to pump blood and you develop less ability to ox send oxygenated blood to the rest of your body, okay? So this is just a little fuzzy um, depiction of what happens in those arteries. So you can see on the left is a healthy pulmonary artery. And this isn't just the pulmonary artery. These are the very tiny little blood vessels and arteries that are going throughout, you know, millions and millions of these uh, throughout your lungs, this is happening too. So you can see the middle picture, um, what's happening is you're getting uh, essentially almost like scar tissue for lack of a better term. It, that's not really what it is, but these cells are proliferating and they're crowding that space more and more. And you can see what happens with more advanced uh, disease on the right. Uh, it gets more crowded, stiffer. The blood vessels can't expand when the heart's pumping against it and it puts more pressure back on the right side of the heart. Okay. And then next uh, on the left-hand side is what a pulmonary arterial should look like. You can see the pink tissue around uh, is the uh, edge of the uh, arterial and it's, uh, it's 
uh, very it, this it's got a wide open space there on the right side you can see how narrow that area is those cells have proliferated grown into it so as you can imagine it's the difference between trying to uh, blow air through a large hose or a, or a straw it becomes very very difficult for the heart to do that okay and this is just a picture of, of what tends to happen over time. On the left side, you can see the right ventricle, which is the kind of the workhorse of the right side of the heart, pumping blood into the lungs. And over time, it becomes um, larger and is uh, less able to do its job. You can see it's even pushing into the other side of the heart. Okay. So, so what are the that? symptoms? Yes. I was going to say, do we want to maybe let's stop here and take a quick poll? And sure. just um, see um, how um, what diagnosis has everyone on the call tonight um, received? And we'll just give everyone a few seconds to give their answers. And you see the results here um, say that on the call tonight, we have 19% have been diagnosed with both HHT and PH, 77% HHT only, and 5% have not had either diagnosis. Okay. You know, that I, I, Nicole, I think, and I think hopefully Michael would agree with this. I, 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 I like the, uh, the results of that poll. Um, we're going to talk about some of the uh, issues with HHD patients and the, the difficulty with diagnosis. In fact, we're going to talk about it on this slide. So I'm, I'm happy to see that a large number of patients uh, uh, with just HHD, or at least have not received the diagnosis, or are, are, are thinking about this disease because you can't diagnose this disease unless you think about it, and that that's the first important step. I think we need to raise the awareness among HHD patients. Um, about pH, and likewise, I think even in the pH uh, group of patients, there there needs some uh, to be some education about the chance that they may have HHT because it uh, it also happens that pH patients are diagnosed and and don't know that they have HHT. So uh, with that in mind, what are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms uh, tend to be these: so fatigue, shortness of breath heart racing or palpitation. Some people will say it feels like their heart is going to jump out of their chest. Maybe you can't run as well as you were last year and you thought you were just getting older, but uh, it may be something else. Um, in some patients, uh, fainting or near fainting or what we call syncope is, is a presenting sign or symptom uh, where you may, you may feel like you're going to faint or you actually do faint. Now, here's the problem. All of these sound like things that happen in HHT in general. You know, if you're anemic, if you have a pulmonary AVM that's not been treated, all of these things also uh, can be attributed to just having HHT. So as I mentioned, that's one, that's one of the, the dangerous things about pH, especially in HHT patients, is that you, you may just think it's because your, your blood count's low. You, you may think, um, you know, maybe there's a pulmonary AVM that you was borderline treatable before, and it might be something different. So, so again, the first step to diagnosis is awareness. Uh, so it's nice to see that people are joining us today to, to get some of that. How common is it? Um, it may be about 10%. That's what studies say in uh, HHT specifically. Uh, pH, Michael, you'll have to give me the number of one in how many million, PAH, uh, it's an incredible, very rare disease. Yeah. Um, pH is more common uh, in patients with ACBRL1, or what we used to call, or we still call ALK1 um, uh, gene. Uh, so pH due to high cardiac output failure is more common, again, because of liver AB AVMs are more common in the ALK1 patients. PAH 
is almost exclusively in alkaline patients. It, it has been reported in endocrine patients, but almost exclusively, and it's probably about 1% uh, of alkaline patients will develop PAH. Now, the risk of PH, I, I said, is about 10%. It's, it's probably lower in endocrine mutation patients, and it's probably a fair bit higher. Some people would say closer to 20%, 20, 20 perhaps, in patients with ALK1. But 1% of, of uh, ALK1 patients, uh, we think, develop PAH. So it's, it's a small number, but uh, again, in a disease where you want to make the diagnosis early, it's, it's important to know that. And okay. Scott, yeah. we do have um, another polling question okay. um, that we'll launch. And the question is, what HHT gene mutation do you have? Okay, and we'll share those results. Okay. All right, so I guess not surprising people who may know a little bit about the connection that we have more ALK1 patients. Uh, again, that, that the incidence is higher in that group. And so um, from a genetic testing, um, we can add this to our questions maybe at the end. Um, but it looks like with 23% not having been genetically testing, just talking about the, maybe the relevance of, of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not going to really spend much time on treatment. Um, I, I think Michael's going to spend quite a bit of time about uh, treatment centers. Um, the treatments are very different between these two groups. Uh, there are PAH-specific uh, medications. They've come a long way. Uh, I'm sure Michael can tell us how many there are now, but at one point there was zero. Uh, not that long ago, there was one. Um, I think 14, 18, I'm not sure, but uh, there's, there's a large number now. So, so um, treatment has come a long way. Uh, it's, it's significantly altered um, for, for the better, the, the quality of life for people with, uh, with uh, PH and PAH. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and turn it over to uh, Michael, after the next slide, I know we want to talk about this just for a moment, um, but uh, Michael will talk a little bit about uh, the PHA and their centers. And Michael, I, I first met Michael, I think, in San Juan last year, and we've had a number of email contacts and seen each other at some other meetings. And he's just a terrific resource for PH patients in general, and certainly uh, for PH patients with HHT. So I'm really glad he's able to make it with us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Scott. So uh, before I, I share my presentation, I briefly want to commend Dr. Olitsky. Um, I think that that is one of the most, one of the finest explanations of pulmonary hypertension that I have yet heard, and I've heard quite a few of them. So thank you so much, Scott. What, a, what an excellent overview of the disease and its relationship to HHT. Um, a couple of things I wanted to add to sort of reinforce some of what Dr. Olitsky said is that pulmonary hypertension, both PAH and the, you know, the more heart-related uh, general pulmonary hypertension, uh, this is a progressive disease. And so one of the things we will often hear at, in the PH association uh, from patients who are experiencing symptoms is that they will experience worsening symptoms. So often we'll hear from someone that they they suddenly realize that they were, uh, a friend of mine is a college lecturer and she developed pulmonary hypertension. And at one point she realized she could no longer walk from her car to her classroom without stopping and gasping for breath. So as Scott pointed out, that exercise tolerance element in most folks we know of with pulmonary hypertension is, is one of the things they identify early on as this progressive symptom. 
that clues them into the fact that there's something uh, not not uh, that they're not quite used to. Um, and so again, I just wanted to uh, reinforce everything Dr. Olitsky said, explaining the condition. I think he did just a marvelous job. Um, thank you. So thank you, Scott. Um, and I would like to just share a little bit about the Pulmonary Hypertension Association with all of you. Um, PHA, like Cure HHT, is an organization dedicated to helping people living with a rare chronic condition. At PHA, that's pulmonary hypertension. As Scott said, pulmonary hypertension uh, can arise in folks living with HHT. And as he also pointed out, folks living with pulmonary hypertension uh, may learn out and get diagnosed with HHT. That's why Nicole and Scott and I are here together tonight. So I wanna briefly share with you some information about the PH Association. If you have pulmonary hypertension, or you believe that you may have pulmonary hypertension, or if you're living with a condition like HHT and may be at risk of developing pulmonary hypertension, you are very welcome to come to PHA. You are very welcome to use our services. You are very welcome to join our support groups. You are very welcome in the PHA community. So as I share these resources, I just want you to keep in mind that these are for you. You are very welcome to them, and I hope that you can, can use them if you do need them. So just to quickly give you an overview of the things that PHA does, we help people find specialized care. As Scott mentioned, specialized care, like with folks living with HHT, is really important with folks living with pulmonary hypertension. PHA can also help you understand and manage pH. If you need to get a refresher on some of the things Scott talked about with the disease mechanisms, you know, how does pH work? or how does PAH work, what's the difference? You can come to PHA to you know, relearn those things. We can also help connect you with other people on the PH journey. We can help you advocate for yourself. Sometimes that means helping you get your voice to ask for the things you need in terms of medical care. Sometimes that means asking your lawmakers or policy makers for help passing laws or policies that are good for you. We can help you engage in research and we can connect you to resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that's on a lot of folks' minds. And so I wanted to share a little bit about our program for helping people navigate this unusual time. So finding specialized care, as we've all said, is very important. And we list not only doctors who treat PH, but we also help people find accredited centers. PHA is responsible for accrediting these centers. And we have a number of these programs around the country. And as Nicole pointed out, it's very important that if you are living with HHT, um, it's a great idea to try to find a center where you can get that HHT specialized care as well as PH specialized care. And I think we can have a good discussion about that a little bit later. Uh, we can help you understand and manage your PH. So if you go to the PH Association website, you can learn more about the various treatments that are available for different kinds of pulmonary hypertension. As Scott said, those living with PAH may be able to uh, benefit from one of 15 specialized medications. Those who have the, you know, the liver AVM causing uh, heavy cardiac output, or as we say in, in PHA, kind of a shorthand, we say heart-related PH because it's the pressure on the heart that's causing that pulmonary uh, hypertension, that high blood pressure in the heart. Um, there's other kinds of care that you, you may need, more sort of heart failure related care, um, which doesn't necessarily require a specialized medication, but it does require uh, specialized you know, uh, care management. And uh, as we said, we have resources to help you understand and manage pH, lots of videos and booklets at PHA that you are very welcome to order, to use, to read number of videos about the disease, about exercise and diet, uh, various other topics. And we can help you connect to others. We have a large network of support groups. You're very welcome to attend those. At this time, all of PHA support groups are meeting virtually. So um, don't let geography be a border or a, a boundary to you. You are welcome to connect with any support group you wish. If the time is right, you know, whether you live in Boston and a group is meeting in Hawaii, 
you are very welcome to join them. They'd be very happy to have you. And you can find all of those resources on our website at phassociation.org support. We have uh, Facebook groups and other things like that as well. And even an 800 number that you can call if you just wanna talk with another patient and uh, get some information or just share, or um, you, know, you need somebody to just lend a listening ear, that's what that 800 number is for. We have a number of resources to help you advocate for yourself, such as an online insurance guide, which includes things like uh, copay assistance programs and uh, different uh, information about ways to help pay for your treatments, as well as other things like you know prior authorization forms and things like that to help you get through um, insurance to get your medications or in, and treatments uh, paid for. We also have programs to help you advocate to policymakers about policies that are good for the PH community. We can help you learn about research, engage in research. Um, our accredited centers are part of a research program, which I can share with you uh, more offline if you're interested in uh, the research aspect of things. We even help folks find clinical trials through our clinical trial finder. Um, you can enter some basic information in our clinical trial finder, and we can help you find trials that are going on related to pulmonary hypertension that are close to you, that involve someone you know, who fits your characteristics. Um, and this also helps people identify uh, healthy patients as well. So even if you don't have pulmonary hypertension or you don't have HHT, you may still be able to participate in a clinical trial. And uh, we, as I said, are helping people try to navigate this really strange, challenging, and sometimes very scary time this COVID-19 pandemic where many of us are challenged to be staying home and some people are feeling very stressed or anxious because the um, they're feeling some of the emotional strain of the preventive measures they have to take, like staying at home or self-isolating or quarantining or any one of those terms we're hearing a lot of lately. Some people are feeling a lot of stress because they're afraid of the disease. They're very worried about catching COVID-19 and what that might mean for them. That's a lot of stress that people are under and we understand that. So we've put together a program to help provide some education, support, information to help us all get through this pandemic safely together. And so at this time I will pause and ask if anyone has any questions about PHA, even from my colleagues, Nicole and Scott. Nicole, I am afraid that I cannot hear you. Sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying is that um, both the Cure HHT website and the Pulmonary Hypertension Association website um, have a full listing of all their centers of excellence. But this chart is just um, an overview, a snapshot of the centers of excellence for both of us, um, where it treats both HHT and pH. And the, inter the, the thing to note is if it has an asterisk in it, that actually means that one of the pH specialists is part of the HHT team. For all of these other locations, it's possible that the pH center is, is separate from the HHT center, but that they're both available um, at those institutions. And so now we'll move over to um, some questions that we have. Um, Marla, who's online with us tonight, um, is asking, how do you test for pH? I don't think I've been tested. I have liver lungs, GI, and nose? So uh, in general, a first test for many HHT patients is going to be an echocardiogram. Uh, and I guess I would call that a screening test um, because m most HHT patients are going to be getting echocardiograms somewhat routinely looking for things like um, uh, pulmonary AVM. So most patients, the first step is an echocardiogram. It's non-invasive. It's relatively simple. 
Um, the issue with echocardiogram is it gives you estimations of pulmonary uh, artery uh, pressures, uh, but it does also look at the function of the heart. The true diagnosis, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, really does require a right heart catheterization. I think that's the gold standard, correct? That's absolutely correct, Scott. And, and Scott's right, you know, asking for that echo is, if you're not getting that already, um, re relatively routinely, that echo helps doctors identify if there's a problem, right? That's very, that's how we sort of phrase it. It's very general, right? Um, but it doesn't give you a measure of, of the, the, the pressures in the pulmonary arteries. In order to get that specific measure, you need to have a right heart catheterization. And if you're not familiar with that, that's a little bit more invasive. That can be um, sort of a, a, a lengthy procedure. Um, in layman's terms, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Olitsky for a more medical interpretation. In layman's terms, a, a kind of a, a tiny tube is run either through uh, the, the groin. Some folks have had them through their arms. That's very unusual or through the neck. So through the groin or through the neck, a, a catheter, a tiny itty bitty tube is run down into the arteries, uh, into the, the heart lung area, and a very specific measurement is taken that helps the, the cardiologist get a specific read on the pressure in that artery. And that's how we're able to specifically say and diagnose pulmonary hypertension. Yes, and the and a large number of measurements, it's safe to say, are taken. And some of those measurements can help to distinguish whether you have pulmonary hypertension because of liver AVMs or you have pulmonary hypertension because of the change in the arterioles itself uh, or, or PAH. So a right heart catheterization, as Michael said, is, is really the gold standard way to test this. And I would assume it's unlikely that any pH specialist would make would uh, would uh, suggest that one not be done. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. So the next question that we have um, actually um, kind of tag on to each other from two different people online. Um, Julie is asking, what exactly is exer exercise intolerance, and Stephen is asking if physical exercise for an HHT patient can help mitigate the onset of pH. Two good questions. Um, I think exercise intolerance, uh, I, I, I guess the best way to define that is um, the inability to exercise that you either had at one point or, or you think you should have. So. Uh, if you were running marathons a year ago, and as Michael said, this is progressive, you know, it became a little harder, uh, a little bit harder, your times were going down, uh, and we're not talking over decades necessarily, we, that, that may happen anyway, but we're, you know, if, if that happens over a relatively short period of time, and you notice a significant worsening in your ability to exercise like you used to be able to, um, all other things being relatively equal. Uh, that, that's what I think most people would think of exercise intolerance. Um, the other question I think was, can exercise help mitigate? Um, that, uh, you know, that's a question I think that's kind of tricky to answer. I would say uh, being in good health is always a good uh, thing. And uh, will it uh, uh, eliminate the chance or decrease the chance of these other things occurring? N no, probably not. Uh, PAH, uh, at least in HHD patients, is generally genetic. Uh, it's mm -hmm. caused by a gene mutation. Um, again, lung uh, liver AVMs leading to high output cardiac failure, um, and and PH probably not going to change that. But being in good uh, uh, good shape is always is always a good thing, and and uh, can help to at least limit some of the effects. Uh, of, of what else is happening. I think, and Michael, uh, maybe you can uh, answer the question, I think that sometimes come up about exercise when you have pH, because I know there was a time yes. where it was, um, it was thought that it was bad for pH, pH and PAH patients to exercise, mm -hmm. and I, I know that thinking has changed now. Yes, yeah, I wanna double down on what Dr. Olitsky said just a moment ago. 
and I'll even add to the exercise intolerance. Another way that you could think of that, at least in 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 our community, we often hear folks simply say movement. You know, there are some folks who don't feel symptomatic, terribly symptomatic, being still. It's when they're moving around that they're really having a problem. It's when they try to climb a flight of stairs. Um, there, there truly are people living with pulmonary hypertension who, when they sit, when they're being still, feel okay. They can feel okay. But they may try to cross a room and suddenly be terribly out of breath feel as though they felt they've just run a great distance. So uh, for some pH folks, that exercise intolerance may simply mean movement. When you move, it's harder. You know, those symptoms come on or they come on worse when you move. Um, that's that's just true of a lot of our folks. Um, and as, as Scott said, the thinking of, around exercise itself with folks who've been diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension has changed. Back in the day, folks were told, absolutely don't, don't move around, it's very bad for you. And we've, we've learned that's not true. What is true is that it's very, um, it's, it's important to have movement in your life, but you must do so very safely. And so what we advise is that you talk to your doctor. Um, there are a number of, of wonderful programs out there like pulmonary rehabilitation or even cardiac rehabilitation may be uh, prescribed by a doctor. These are sort of uh, medical kinds of supervised, almost like gyms, um, where you can, you'd go in and you're supervised usually by a, a respiratory therapist and teams of other um, uh, allied health professionals who will help you safely learn to do activities that are good for you, that can, um, you know, strengthen your heart and improve your breathing capacity. Um, so as, as Scott said, it is true that we no longer say don't exercise, but we do say to exercise safely. So we really ask people to speak with their doctors, um, but we're very optimistic. A lot of folks show a lot of promise. They do start exercising and they do start to feel better in some cases. And that's, that's wonderful. So um, yes, the thinking has changed on that. Is there anything you wanna add to that, Scott? I'm not sure. What no, the, uh, what the no, thing I think the clarification about the exercise intolerance is, is helpful and and, um, and sometimes striking this the symptoms people can have. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So we have um, two questions also similar re related. Um, one is asking, I have HHT with numerous pulmonary AVMs that are too small to coil. Would this potentially cause pH or is the cause mainly with liver AVMs? Um, and kind of a secondary question from another individual is, do small PAVMs cause pulmonary pressure to go up or down? And do they cause any other pH problems? So I think the first question, uh, will the small, uh, can you, that was, can the small PAVMs cause uh, pulmonary hypertension? Yes, or is it mainly caused by liver AVMs? Mainly caused by liver AVMs. Um, in fact, um, the uh, I don't wanna say never, I, 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 I'm not sure enough to say never, but generally we're talking about li liver AVMs. Um, in fact, um, sometimes you might even think about a pulmonary AV AVM being a kind of an escape valve for some of that pressure. Um, and so pulmonary AVMs can be tricky to manage in the face of uh, pulmonary hypertension. So that, that's something, a very specific nuance that you know, clearly needs uh, expert uh, expertise in both HHT and pH to, to deal with. Okay, uh, thank you. So our, our next question um, online is asking, can embolizations cause a change in the flow and pressures that influence the development of pH and specifically, um, they're talking about 10 to 20 or more embolizations. So I don't know specifically about that number, but again, theoretically, and, and again, I don't wanna to get too far out of my uh, league here, um, but if you think about the pul pulmonary AVM that allows shunting of blood through. So if theoretically you did have pulmonary arterial hypertension and you had this right, to, if you had this shunt, which allowed blood instead of going through those very high resistance 
uh, blood arterials and it just shunts it back to the heart, theoretically, then it might be lower. It might be lowering some of the effect on the heart. Now, of course, having a pulmonary AVM is another issue that needs to be dealt with. So, yes, it, it, I think theoretically, and, and um, again, I would speak to your pulmonologist or pH specialist um, who's treating your uh, PAVM as well. Um, closing that could significantly change the the dynamics of your pulmonary circulation. So an interesting question that we have um, online is asking, can PH or PAH come on suddenly? Um, and they're specifically kind of relating it to um, either bronchitis or some kind of lung activity um, where having that activity um, or an episode um, severely decline their breathing capacity and fatigue? So I don't think those acutely allow you to develop it. What they might do is de help is make you decompensate. So for instance, if you um, if you uh, already have a high output uh, issue with your heart, so your heart is working harder, and let's say you have significant nosebleeds, GI bleeding, something like that, and you become very anemic, now your heart has to pump even harder. Let's say you go to a higher altitude, I suspect would be another place. So there, there are things that probably do not really lead to the disorder developing, but you may your heart may be compensating to a certain degree. And then if you change something in that circuitry, so to speak, or, or the dynamics of your blood flow, anemia, altitude, things like that, um, or you get very sick and your heart has to work even faster because of that, those things might lead to decompensation. So your heart is not able to keep up and, and you would notice the symptoms of pH. Uh, Michael, your thoughts? I, I completely agree, Scott. Um, I don't even anecdotally know of someone who's developed some kind of acute pulmonary hypertension or, or who has had this instance of some sort of sudden onset of a condition that caused or felt like it lead, led to causing uh, pulmonary hypertension. So I, I completely agree with Scott. What I will add, though, is that we have heard of many cases of folks who were misdiagnosed with chronic bronchitis or chronic lung diseases or you know other sorts of conditions like asthma and and the various symptoms or uh, episodes related to those misdiagnoses were actually you know worsening symptoms of pulmonary hypertension but that's chronic uh, so that that I much more that I hear much more commonly is sort of those misdiagnosed chronic bronchitis, but I'm not familiar. As Scott said, I, I don't know of anyone who's gotten a case yeah, of bronchitis that caused pulmonary hypertension. Of course, the HHC community knows about uh, misdiagnosis and delayed diagnosis, and, and the pulmonary hypertension community knows that all too well. I, I think. It's yeah. probably safe to say it's it's unusual for somebody with, I think the delay I've read two years, is that a typical delay now? In HHT, it tends to be much longer, um, but you know, people with pH get sick a lot faster generally. So, um, but I, I, I know that there's a delay in diagnosis of pH patients quite frequently. Yep, yeah, that's okay. correct. So we have um, a question two questions um, from Jacqueline and Courtney um, asking about the heart catheterization and asking, one, can this test be done if you have coils in your lungs? And two, should some, how often should you get that testing done? Okay, so it can be done if you have had uh, pulmonary AVMs embolized. Uh, as Michael said, usually through a large vein in your leg or a vein in your neck, rarely a vein in your wrist. Um, so it doesn't need to go through that, that same circulation. Um, how often does it need to be done? That is very uh, specific, I think, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, treatment uh, criteria and, and guidelines based upon your disease, how your um, how you are uh, managing with treatment, uh, 
There are some newer technologies, cardiac MRI, which I know is being used at some centers that um, I, I don't know I would say replace, have replaced it by any means, but uh, may, may uh, be helpful. Some physicians rely on echocardiogram afterwards to a certain degree. So uh, unfortunately, there's no one answer for how often. I think the only answer that's pretty definitive is you, you're going to need at least one to make the diagnosis. Okay. Can I add to that, Scott, just to, sure. to alleviate folks' concerns that they may be asked to do this invasive test on like a weekly basis or something? Okay. What we're we're likely saying it's it's it would be something that regularly occurs with patients somewhere between every few months and once or twice a year. But it varies a great deal. It varies a great deal. It is necessary for ongoing treatment and things like that, but as Scott said, there are many variables and only you know, an accredited specialist will be able to help you understand why you would need it and when you would need it. Um, but we're talking a few months to once or twice a year maybe. Okay, um, so Michael, I think this question is for you. What age group has the highest incidence of pH? Oh, yeah, so we, we tend to see it develop in uh, primarily folks in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, we don't have a lot more data on that. We do see it in people of all ages, but primarily in um, the, the term we used to use, I don't think we say this much anymore, but was uh, uh, women in their childbearing years is a term that you'll see in pH literature a lot. Um, as as the, the condition does happen more much more frequently in women than in men. Um, but we, we see it in, I guess, middle-aged folks a lot. Uh, that's that's most common. Um, Scott, do you have any uh, other I was going to say, Would you agree it's safe to say the genetic form occurs in younger people uh, more commonly the, uh, in, yeah, in the age community? Yes. That's accurate. That's accurate. Okay, um, so Dr. Olitsky, we're asking for clarification of what you meant by high altitude. What elevation would you consider this to be? So that, that, that's a good question. And unfortunately, I'm not going to have a good answer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it really depends, again, on uh, your other health issues, uh, how well your pH is being treated. Um, there is testing that some centers do, maybe all centers, Michael would know, where, um, you know, uh, cabins are pressurized, I believe, for 8,000 feet uh, if you're flying. So, you know, if, you know it may be that 8,000 feet is, is a place where you might need to think about is is that too high an altitude inside uh, inside an airplane where it's pressurized? And and um, sensors can actually test you uh, to see how you uh, function. Now, of course, if you're sitting on a plane, it's a lot different than mountain climbing uh, out in in the Rockies at fourteen thousand feet in Colorado. So so there are those uh, those nuances as well. But um, I, I think, like the right heart catheterization, that's going to be individualized to every person. And for some people, uh, uh, I think, Michael, you can speak to this much better than I can. Some people, uh, some of their treatment is moving from a high altitude location. Yeah, that's absolutely happened. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, some of our, um, not to name check anyone, but one of, some of our best centers are in Denver, Colorado. You know, so there are folks in the Mile High City who are getting great treatment, and um, often what we what we'll hear again this is this is more anecdotal is that it's the change in altitude, um, and that's again like like Dr. Litsky said it's incredibly variable changes a lot. There's no one number that well if you pass this that's the problem number or well if you go below this that'll fix everything. Um, but it tends to be those changes in numbers. Folks who tend to have lived their whole lives at a high altitude, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. But again, that's more anecdotal than, than science. And talk to your doctor. Okay. Uh, we have a question asking if it's more pH is more common in men or women. Oh, women. So, yes. <laughs> But but Scott, have you have you noticed in the HHT community if there's any if that correlation holds? 
I don't know that uh, myself. I'm, I'm not, not certain about that. And and I don't know, uh, I'll, I'll ask you a question back, which might, um, in a hereditary form, just so other people understand that, um, I think 10 or 15% of PH, PAH is hereditary form, which is very sim behaves very similarly to what we're talking about with PAH in ALK1 patients. But uh, is there a yep, genetic, uh, is there a, um, uh, sex predilection for uh, for the hereditary form? I, I don't know that answer. I may, do you? Yeah. Yes. They, that again, it it looks similar with with um, more women, uh, even in the genetic form. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have um, a question asking if um, arterial fibrillation is connected with pH. So um, it is one of those things that can uh, decrease the heart's ability to pump blood. Uh, and so you get back up in the blood and pressure building up and you could get uh, higher pressures transmitted back. Um, I don't know if that could, if that is often or even ever the only reason, but certainly in patients with liver AVMs, with high output uh, cardiac uh, state, those, those people are more prone to atrial fibrillation. So now you've just added another insult, so to speak, to uh, a problem. You may be well compensated and your heart is pumping fine and compensating, uh, but then you add atrial fibrillation on top of that and now the pressure builds up even higher. So so I don't know that, I don't know the answer if it can be the only cause, but it can certainly be a contributing cause. Okay. Um... And let's see, one of our questions that was written into us. Um, what is the best, um, let's see, what is the best treatment for nosebleeds in your opinion? And will that treat treatment complicate pH? So oh, I think the, the, the question about what the best treatment is, is is somewhat difficult. I think that that depends on obviously the nature of nosebleeds, other um, concurrent problems people are facing. I, I think what is safe to say is that we have better treatments than we did at one time. Some of those are with newer drugs. Uh, some of those are uh, up and coming, we think. We're, we're looking at some studies to look at uh, improving the treatment. Uh, we, I think everybody has uh, read or heard about, hopefully, about Avastin and, and perhaps doxycycline. These are some new drugs that, uh, that we're using. Uh, the Pasopidin trial we're very excited about. Um, I want to just switch it to the other direction because I, I don't recall how many pH patients who may or may not know they have HHT we, we might have, uh, but Michael and I have talked about this in the pH community. Um, many of the, not many, but some of the PAH specific drugs uh, increase nosebleeds. So unfortunately, um, some patients with PAH experience significant nosebleeds and some of them may have HHT and don't know it, and they and they, uh, they prescribe their uh, nosebleeds simply to the medication, and and this becomes part of the challenge uh, among pH patients diagnosing pH patients uh, who have HHT because clearly we want them to get their screening uh, for the other complication potential complications of HHT, and mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's also why it's often uh, can be uh, tricky or difficult for the treatment of pH in an HHT patient because some of those medications are going to worsen those bleeds. So I, I don't think that specifically answers that question. Again, it's one of these things that I think is very individualized, but uh, we really see where it, 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 it's, it's a two-way street, so to speak. Uh, you know, uh, pH and those bleeds could be a, a, a sign of having HHT in an und undiagnosed person. Michael, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to add something which is probably painfully obvious to everyone on this conversation, but if you're experiencing something like that and that's a new symptom for you, share that with your doctor. 
or if you're experiencing it and it's not necessarily a new symptom, the nosebleeds, but maybe they are getting worse, um, share that with your doctor. Um, whether you've started a new medication and you, you're not sure, always share it with your doctor. Record those things and share that kind of stuff with your doctor. All of those concerns are legitimate. They're valid. They're worth bringing to your, your care team for consideration. So, you know, if you start to have the nosebleeds or you've had nosebleeds before, but they're getting worse, share that information with your doctor. Okay. Um, we're going to do two more questions. Um, one, I'm going to make it a little bit more general in that if, if there's somebody um, in another country that isn't necessarily covered by a center of excellence for HHT or PH, um, and they have been diagnosed with either PH or PAH and HHT, um, what advice would you give them to set up a care plan and who, you know, what, what, do you, what would you suggest for their next steps? Mm. It's a good question. Um, they're all good questions. Uh, so, Fortunately, there are HHT centers and physicians who know HHT in other countries. Uh, I'm sure the same is true of PH. Um, I happen to have been in Shanghai, China uh, earlier this year before uh, the coronavirus breakout. And I, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a PH specialist and an entire PH team um, in, in Shanghai at a, uh, I think a 1500 bed hospital. So uh, I think it was a 30 person pulmonary uh, 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 pulmonary program there. Um, and they also had an interest in HHT. So, so uh, there are physicians who elsewhere in the world, and I'm sure, uh, in fact, I think, Michael, you were the person who gave me a lead uh, through a patient advocate in, in either Beijing or Shanghai that eventually led yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, I seek so that's right. sometimes it's, it's reaching out to somebody like Michael or the PHA, and uh, finding a, a patient advocate somewhere that tells you where they're being treated. So there are uh, there are resources uh, and there are, there are different avenues to find those. Uh, Michael, I'm sure you uh, have access to a number of people around the world like that. Yeah, we, we try at PHA to maintain a directory of all of the PH associations around the world. So you can actually go to the PHA website and there's a, a section that says international and there's just a simple directory. It looks almost like a Google map kind of thing. Um, this is not an advertisement for Google. It's just, that's what it looks like, is, is one of those maps. And there's little uh, markers on the map and it, you know, you can find those associations. If you don't see some in the area you're looking for, you can contact our association. I'm sure Nicole similarly has some way of reaching out or networks or ideas of contacting HHT organizations or professionals around the world um you know it's not always easy but it can be done and we you know your advocacy organizations that's what we're here for is to try to help connect you to those resources uh whether and that's not only for those who are living in those other areas but if like dr Olitsky, you're traveling you know if you have pulmonary hypertension and you travel we want you to know where the closest ph center of excellence is that's that's important to us because it's important to you for you know if there should be an emergency or if you should need it we want you to be able to contact specialists close to where you are um sometimes your your physicians may even have contacts through their you know meetings they've been to and other things like that so um please ask you know that's a that's a, a good opportunity for self-advocacy ask okay and then um our last question um is really just about um, screening for HHT patients um, are, are, and asking, are liver AVM something that you typically screen for or high cardiac output, or is it really just, um, you know, a symptomatic type of screening that would occur to determine if you have pH? That, that's a really good question and one that um, there's been a lot of discussion in the HHT community. I, I think at one point it was really thought to be uh, something that you you screen when if somebody's symptomatic. And maybe part of that was because there wasn't a whole lot that could be done uh, about it. But uh, and I think we'll see this uh, hopefully coming out with some of the recommendations in the near future that 
screening is uh, is important to look for liver AVMs um, and and uh, screening to look uh, at your heart uh, not only for the presence of pulmonary AVMs but also to look for is there high cardiac uh, output state or uh, is your pulmonary pressure uh, elevated so um, I think we're going to see some of those recommendations coming out. It, they've been discussed. Uh, some physicians feel slightly differently, but I think the overwhelming majority uh, do believe that there should be some screening done, yes. And Michael, I would throw it to you. Do you know if um, HHT is something on the radar for screening pH patients for or asking questions to kind of reduce that lag time in diagnosis? Well, I'll tell you, it's thanks to Cure HHT and specifically to Dr. Olitsky raising that notion with me, which has led to a number of conversations we're having in the medical community, in the patient community, and at our advocacy organization to say there are risks there for people living with pH that they may have HHT and not know it. You know, we have to be mindful that we're a rare disease community, but, you know, there are all these comorbidities that could arise that that could, could have been, uh, people could be living with their whole lives and may not identify. Um, and we know that so well, and we're gonna work with Cure HHT, these amazing partners here of mine, to develop messaging that will help people get the best information so that they can identify HHT um, if, if they're at risk of that and, and know what to do if they do see signs and symptoms. Great. Well, thank you. And again, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate both of your time tonight. Um, obviously, time did not allow us to answer everyone's questions, um, but we will um, try to get to them uh, this week. Um, we will share those with Michael and Scott and, um, and then get their feedback to those that weren't um, answered. Um, and just on behalf of everyone at Cure HHT, I just want to thank you for attending tonight's virtual meetup and staying connected with us. Cure HHT is the only patient advocacy organization in the world for HHT, and we are really here for you every day. Um, the entire community of patients, family, healthcare providers, and researchers, and that you can rely on us to answer your questions, provide timely updates, and offer support. And we work with um, partners like Pulmonary Hypertension Association on a regular basis. Um, we are both rare disease communities and, you know, we do have a shared hope, um, which is just to give those affected by our uh, rare disease a chance for a normal life. And so um, this virtual meetup was just part of our webinar series and just one way that we're able to accomplish our mission. Um, and so I want to remind you that um, we have resources in our resource library for pulmonary hypertension. Um, in a follow-up email, um, you will get a link to the recorded webinar that you can share with your family, um, as well as a link to a page of um, pulmonary hypertension specific related resources in the Cure HHT library. Um, and don't forget that Dr. Olitsky will be hosting this Ask the Doctor series um, every couple of months. So stay tuned and join us next time for a whole new set of questions. Again, I want to thank Scott and Michael for volunteering their time tonight and leading this incredible conversation. Uh, we truly appreciate your participation and hope that everyone enjoys their evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you both so much. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night.